Good morning. I'm so glad that you guys could join us. I know <laughs> I know that we had link problems, so um, that will be moot uh, because you'll be receiving this recording in your inbox. I'd love to introduce our presenter today, Dee Suberla, author, teacher, coach, and business consultant. Uh, she works with individuals and groups and achieving results. During her 30 years in the pharmaceutical and medical device industry, uh, Dee developed expertise in project management and evolved into an accomplished consultant, speaker, and coach. She's an adjunct instructor with the University of Chicago Professional Education. She owns DG Suberla Consulting, LLC, and Oak Line Press to help others write and publish their own books. Kind of cool if you're a wannabe uh, author. As an engaging and motivating speaker, Dee breaks concepts down to optimize the learning experience and inspires attendees to make the necessary changes to achieve their goals. She's the author of two nonfiction books. Come on, let's play. Living, playing, and moving forward. And poof, you're a project manager and other delusions of grandeur. And she recently released an action fantasy novel, The Zing Fling, for younger readers. She has a BA from Columbia and an MBA from Webster University. She's an authorized trainer for everything DISC. Other certifications include the Project Management Professional, PMP, which we're all aware of, and trainer for the Resilience Advantage. Uh, with no further ado, I would love to turn it over to Dee because she's going to help you plan your project like a pro. Take it away, Dee. Woo! Let's do this thing. So thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, so today we're going to hit the highlights. Uh, we have three classes. This is the first one today. Uh, we, yes, we had a few technical uh, problems. There shouldn't be any problems at all. You'll get the, this video, and I want to invite you to go ahead and if you have questions, you can email them to me before the next one. We expect the next one to go off real well. So let's get this thing going as soon as I learn how to operate my computer. Our objectives for these three weeks is to get you familiar with some of the basic terms, recognize some of the basic processes, and I want you to become familiar with a few tools. You're going to be getting uh, um, a handout. It's called a toolkit, and it's got a, um, it's just got the word document tools uh, that you could use for inspiration to create your own down the road. Or um, there's a few of them we are looking at in the class, and so you can use those to follow along. And then we're going to visit a few ideas on how you lead without authority, because that is what project managers do. They don't have the authority. Many of the people don't report to them. And darn it, sometimes some are at a higher level than we are. So that presents a few interesting um, situations. So a lot of times I get the question, well, why even worry about project management? What's the point? And it is a method to deliver project results. And if you're dealing with lots of projects and big projects, for sure, you're going to want to get a more formal training than this. But this, for regular amounts of projects, we all have projects in our life. This, I think, would be enough to help you improve on what you're doing. And then there's all kinds of places in between. So project management has steps to follow. You initiate, you plan, you execute, you monitor and control, and then you close. The word control is not up there. It makes it too long. Monitor and control is considered one step. So already we're breaking rules. It gives you tools to use. There's something called a WBS, a work breakdown structure. We'll talk about that. The schedule. Uh, there's tools for risks and issues and decisions, either logs or matrices or something to work with to help you deal with those things. And then we have practices. And this little tiny word here is the single most important part about tools. You get a tool and then you have a practice around it. Somebody gives you a template, you bend and break that thing and make it work for you. Do not spend any time like, oh, I don't know what to put here. What, what are we supposed to put here? The, you, the tool should be natural, and it needs to serve the project. And so that's one of the places people trip up a lot when they first learn about this. Um, when you take a look at um, some of the uh, millions of steps that can be done on a project, um, you really need to get focused and tailor to your needs. So your practices on how you use tools is a key um, success criterion. And then... 
bottom line is you have projects to manage and people to lead. We manage the projects and we lead the people. We are not managing people. In the beginning, when I uh, was first doing this, we had a lot of higher level, higher educated people working with lower educated people. And when those lower educated people called implementation implementation specialists were there, um, they were having hissy fits. You know, we don't report to them. They don't boss us around. It's like, that's true. You don't and they don't. But they will take care of things you don't want to take care of. There's a whole sort of vocabulary one's got to watch out for when you're first starting because people don't report to the project manager. Almost never, but you know, there's always a, some example to prove me wrong. So today is class one. We're gonna look at the basics, a project frame, a charter. Next week, we're talking about planning and that's, that, that's really the bulk of this. Uh, the work breakdown structure, the network diagram schedule, and we're gonna start into risk management. And then in the end, um, we will finish up risk management, We'll talk about closing the project, and then um, we'll wrap it up. We'll have some time. People can ask questions, et cetera. And if you do have questions, it looks like we might have one now. I'm not sure, um, Shannon, but um, go ahead and put them in the chat. So why use project management methods? We want to create the structure. We want to give guidance for success, not just for ourselves, but for our team. So you're learning what to tell the people who are working with you. If you're running a team in a volunteer situation, this applies, or if you're bringing a new drug to market, this applies. Um, you wanna define what you're gonna do simultaneously with the people who are gonna be affected by it. People in, in a work environment, people um, who will be receiving the end result, maybe you're putting in a software, maybe you're building a house, who knows what you're doing, but the people who are gonna receive the benefits of your work are also stakeholders. And you wanna know the requirements for this thing to work. And you can, it helps you manage issues and, when, and risk management is an extremely important part of this. And the, the purpose of risk management is to think about everything that can go wrong and when you do that and you put things in place to minimize or eliminate that, um, you have less issues. And issues are the things that mess up projects and cause delays, and we'll talk about that. So the first thing here, this whole presentation is based on the Project Management Institute, PMI, and their books. Uh, their two PMBOK guides, uh, PMBOK 6th edition, and PMBOK 7th edition. They took something that was fairly complicated and then they doubled it. That was nice. <laughs> so <laughs> PMBOK 6 is the one that has all the, everything you could ever do in a project. It weighs about two pounds. So you're not gonna learn all that. If you wanna become a certified project manager, you're gonna have to know all this stuff. The second PMBOK, um, has a big focus on themes of what you're doing and tailoring and the criticality of tailoring. Many of us early on said, whoa, can't do what they're saying here. We need to tailor it. We knew that. But some people are really still trying to follow step by step. So uh, between the two of them, there's a lot of information there. And if you're working, we do have a, uh, a pharmacist here. If you're working in the realm of... Um, uh, research, drug development, uh, some kind of medical product development. There's a new piece out and it's called Making the Right Moves. And it, um, I think at the bottom of this slide is the link to that. And this puts project management into the, into the framework of research. And research is something that nobody's making schedules, you know, because you don't know you're discovering things. And so that's, that's one that I like to tell people about. If you want more on that, let me know. There are different types of project management. And uh, let me see, I have covered up. Okay, oh, so what I'm telling you here is it's best if you go to PMBOK uh, 7 to get more information on these definitions. Predictive, adaptive, and hybrid. And 
you're going to be hanging around with this a lot. I would get these definitions in your head. If you go and Google types of project management, I think I found 12 or more. So people will confuse a scheduling um, software like Microsoft Project as a type of project management. Or I earlier, we were talking about um, uh, Basecamp, which is a tool for people leading projects where the whole team can get in there and converse and share documents and look at things together. And they called that a type of project management. These are tools. Those are tools, push them down to the ground floor. <laughs> They're tools. They're not types of project management. So the types of project management Predictive, it's also known as waterfall. And these are for the big guns, I think. It's certainly the way clinical trials go. If you were building a smart home, uh, you know, maybe a 3,000 foot uh, square foot home and it's got a, the latest and greatest, um, the big ones that have, and maybe not the home so much, but partially, but if you are having to meet FAA standards or FDA standards or there's compliance and you have to go so far and then you have to get approval to move on, you can't do it any other way. And so this waterfall, this section has to finish, we get checked, and then we can go on versus adaptive. And another word for that is agile. And I put under that all the other things that are like that. There's scrum and there's this and there's that. And it's all about fast and making sure everybody knows what's going on. I think um, uh, I think Patricia, you might've talked a little bit about that. You were doing the sort of scrum type of thing where you're making sure everybody has their to-do list and everybody knows what's coming up next. This is often used with um, short-term things and things that you can, the key is to learn from discovery, learn as you go. So you keep putting out pieces of information. People see it, they agree, and or they make adjustments and they go. And so you're learning as you discover. Never works in drug development for sure. And in other places too, for maybe telephones and things like that. So you're learning as you go. You're shaping the product as you go. Hybrid, of course, is the blending of the two. These are the three types. So when I mentioned that um, smart home, <laughs> I think that's more of a hybrid where you've got to mix these things together. So if you want to get into project management, you really need to know um, where you're going with it and what you need to learn. I don't think the adaptive, there's not that much to learn about that. I mean, it, in both cases, it's common sense and you've probably done a lot of this stuff before. You're just going to learn names for it. But uh, you know, I would start with the predictive and then add on the um, adaptive because you get a lot of hybrid stuff. So I have worked on uh, projects where uh, I think it may have been at Abbott and they had 15 feet of equipment, analytical equipment that takes in samples and things happen and it spits out stuff and reports and things like that. Definitely a hybrid because software is where adaptive seems. <laughs> And you can do two weeks on apps and then show those apps to your client. Like, yeah, no, it does, I don't want it to look like that. It has to do this. And they can go back and make quick changes. So I'm just going to pull these three up. So here is the summary of the three. And predictive, adaptive, hybrid. And then um, we talked through these things. So I, I use pharmaceuticals on predictive. It's my home base. <laughs> but... Um, there are other, you know, think in terms of compliance type of things. And then software for adaptive and hybrid is, I put in there, the diagnostic equipment, but also it could be think in terms of the smart house if that doesn't make sense to you. Questions? So far, so good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, so far, so good. Good. Hey. So this is a little cut and paste job out of... Um, Chembox 7, and that is the one that, that's the newer one, which gives a lot of theory and themes, et cetera. And they talked about tailoring. And whatever it is you're doing, I just circled just enough process because this is the drum that I'm always beating. People get so tangled up in process that they prevent progress. 
And this is never, ever, ever about the process. It's about the product that you're working on. The process is a servant <laughs> and not a taskmaster. So if you are in a place um, that is process um, focused, it's good if it's compliance because FDA mandates we do these things. Okay, can't mess around with that. But project management is a business process and you need to make it work for you and to not treat it as though it's compliance related. So they're different. Project management that we're talking about today is not a compliance thing and it's not designed to meet FAA or you know whatever um, uh, compliance item there is. I'm just checking here. Okay, so just enough. Another thing that comes up, you know, because schedules, 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 and project management, I get a lot of questions on time management, and I want to segregate. Stephen Covey's time management matrix is at the heart. Whoever you're reading about it, this is where it came from. And this book, and it talks about things that you have to do, important or not important, urgent or not urgent. In the first quadrant, these are the things you really need to make sure you're going to get done. So when you're scheduling your own time or your team's time or whatever, oh, I got to do these things first. Bottom right, it, or, um, I think the trickiest one is, uh, where is it, the urgent and not important. What the heck is that? That's the phone ringing. That's your computer dinging. Ding. 52 emails. Ding. Those things feel urgent, but when you're busy, you got to budget time for when you're going to check email. That's what this is about. And this is not what this presentation is about. <laughs> this is not about time management. So just wanted to tip my hat to Stephen. And uh, this is important stuff, and we should all learn to prioritize our own time as well as um, prioritize elements to our projects. So here's an example of what it's not about. I always like to start with some terms. Uh, the project manager. The project manager is assigned by the organization. And that what it means is that whoever's paying the bills says you spend your time on driving this project through our process to come out with this particular item, whether it's a service or um, a product or something else, uh, a, a new software or a training program. Uh, you are authorized as this. And uh, when I when I first started, there weren't any project managers. They were implementation specialists and planning managers. <laughs> so there were two of them doing the job. And uh, the sponsor is a person or group th that provides support and they move obstacles for you. They represent the project at higher levels of the organization. So we don't even know what that was. Um, that it it gets the resources it needs, that the people who are um, in charge understand what the project is about. They, so that sponsor is somebody that you would be updating periodically and uh, making sure that they have the information they need uh, to keep an eye out for you. A project has a definition. It's a temporary endeavor. You take it on to create a unique product, service, or result. There's a beginning to it and an end. I can't tell you how many times I would go into a client and they want to implement project management. It's all, okay, here you guys all have your projects and uh, start date. You know, okay, started. And once your end date, oh, it never ends. It goes on forever. <laughs> it's like, what are you talking about? And they're, they're putting in processes. And so, especially in a new group or a new business, you need to, you know, create some processes. That is a project, but it does have an ending. There's the creation of the process, the verification that the process works, and then the closing of the project, where at which point you integrate the process into doing general business. Very clear end to it. And if you don't do that, you'll never have another job and you'll just have to... <laughs> keep running around fixing little problems or something. So if it's a project, beginning and end, period. No other options on that one. The program 
is a group of related projects and activities that are managed in a coordinated way. And you're doing it because it makes the most sense. You can get the most out of it. There's five or six big things that have to be done in order for this program to be successful. Each of those projects has a beginning and an end, but the process, I'm sorry, but the program itself may have new projects coming in all the time and then closing and new ones come in. And so a program can go on for quite a while. It doesn't necessarily have a sharp ending. You'll see a lot of programs in the marketing organizations. And, you know, you know, customers first. And this is all the different things we're going to do to make sure our customers are first. And we're going to do these three first. And then after that, we're going to do these things. So these are related projects. And um, uh, the, the rule still applies. <laughs> then there is the project scope. And the product scope, and we'll turn. We'll talk about scope more when we um, go into the work breakdown structure. The project scope is everything that has to be done to get the project delivered. It's the products that you're covering, the, or the services, or whatever that result is, and it's how the end product will be delivered. Gosh, we need to make a new suitcase. And this is how we're going to do it. And this is how we're going to deliver it. And it's going to be produced here. And we're going to have these kinds of programs around or projects around it if it's bigger. Um, but, you know, everybody's, you know, somebody's got to design it. Somebody's got to do this and somebody's got to do that. All that stuff around it, we just, we determine how that's going to work. And then we get that into a schedule and we tell everybody how long it's going to take. The product scope is the suitcase that you're building. Oh, wait a minute. We can't build a suitcase that big. We're going to have to turn it into two suitcases. And um, or let's do three suitcases and a very small one and all that instead of trying to make too many compartments. Uh, so our product scope just changed from one suitcase to two to three. That scope of the product changed. So this is just to illustrate the difference between project and product. Now, this is good. This is like putting a little burr <laughs> under your hat, because when you get definitions on project and program, project and product, uh, a lot of other people you know or may work with don't know the differences. Before you start explaining the differences, do they really need to know the differences? <laughs> because as a project manager, you need clarification on these things because you can make a scope change or you could make a product change in order to go uh, to get fewer dollars spent or to have less time to develop. There are things you can change and get, having them clear in your head um, it will, will make it a lot easier. So the biggest offenders of breaking the rules on the, these two sets of definition, of course, is senior management because a lot. Program management sounds so much more sophisticated than project management, and they have no idea what the differences are. You don't have to, you don't have to correct them. Eventually, they should learn if they're going to do a lot with projects. But I just wanted to warn you on that one. Questions? Okay. The next thing we're going to talk about is the triple constraint, and the triple constraint is the scope, that's this dish, timing, this one, and money. Scope, schedule, money. This is the life of a project manager. This is the triple constraint, and they're all related. This guy has got to run from one to the other. If you want, it to, if you want the time to be shorter, uh, Whatever you do to make that happen, if it's possible, it's going to change the dollars and it might change the scope. Okay, you want this in half the time? We can't do three. We're going to have to go back to two suitcases because we can't get all three out on the same time. It'll delay launch. Um, so that's what that's about. And then so you if you have to complete your project sooner than you planned, you can either call out or put it in um, the uh, chat your your boss just come in complete the project six months sooner what's going to change scope dollars or time well time they just forced us to a change 
what's going to happen? Anyone? Bueller? You were going to deliver something in a year, and then the boss said, I need it in six months. What are you going to change? Reduce okay. the scope. Oh, yes. Reduce okay. the scope. Yes. You can re give them less, and you can increase money and say, we need to hire 30 more people to make this happen or something, which would change the... Um, business case on the project a lot, but we're just um, theorizing now. But the thing is, you can't change one without impacting at least one other and usually both. And then if you're if all of a sudden your lab fails an audit and you have to close it for a month and you can't get any lab work done, we're asking, what are you going to change? Well, the first thing to change is the schedule just went out. We're never going to make up for 30 days of no work. And this the dollar figure's probably going to go up because we're going to find another, you know, somebody that might be able to help us or bring in more people or get two labs instead of one. So that's just to give your mind a little workout on um, things that change and that triple constraint. So this is the framework. And this came from, this I think is still in uh, six. Both edition six and seven, by the way, of PMBOK, Project Management Body of Knowledge, are valid. They're both live and real and dependable. So uh, if you really want to pursue this, you want to get both of those if you want to read up on all that stuff. Way a lot of reading. But they simplified the project frame. You start the project, you organize and prepare for it, you carry out the work, and then you end the project. But that's like the frame of a project. And that applies to every project in the universe. So then PMBOK 6 adds the process groups. And here I'm officially showing monitor and control. You monitor the project and you control it. And why control? Because we really don't have control. We think we have control, but we don't have control. <laughs> control is making those changes, the decisions and the changes that have to be made to keep yourself, your project on time or on track, whatever's critical. Sometimes time isn't the biggest factor. Sometimes budget is or something else. So you monitor and then when things start to slip or move, you control and try to keep things um, on the rails there. So you initiate your project. There's nothing there. And then Summer says, hey, we need a project. We need this project. So you officially initiate it. Then you plan it. Then you execute it. And then you close it. When you look at monitor and control, that that it's pretty low in the beginning. But around the end of planning and throughout execution and a little bit of closure, it peaks. It goes up. You're controlling quite a bit. You're running around spinning those plates, right? The, the triple constraint. So here's just a couple of things that might happen there. So project management deliverables, depending on where you are, there's people from different organizations um, and they may have things that they have to do. But in the initiation phase, there's always some financial thing going on. I said budget, but you know, you gotta, you gotta make money at this thing and you know, how you're gonna justify the spend. Um, you need the initial requirements, the absolute top line requirements. We don't have a project if this doesn't happen. Um, you got to get a team together. You create a charter or a study outline. A charter is the one that we're going to um, talk about toward uh, the end of today. It's, it's not too far away. And um, so that's in that tool, that tool um, toolbox. I'm not sure if you got that. Toolkit is what it's called. So if you look at the word initiate here and you see monitor and control, initiate, plan, execute, and close, you see it's a big one and then it's a small one because within each phase, you have to initiate it. What are you going to do? What all do you need? You got to pull them together and then you got to present them for approval or you, you look at the whole picture. The decision has to be made to go to plan. This is the best way to do it. To just start frequently costs a lot more money because you go down a path you think everybody knows and nobody knows. 
this charter, I've had students um, that have walked, they learned about this and you have a little template for it and you can make it be whatever you want. Um, but they've walked in and they have a team they're working with. They say, hey, let's put, I learned about this charter. Let's put this together. And the team loved it because what happens is when you say we're going to make a suitcase, one person thinks a series of suitcases, another one sees a trunk, and everybody thinks they're in agreement. But until you've written it down, you get those requirements that, that you know of right now down on paper and you have people sort of sign off on it or check, say, yes, I agree. And uh, maybe they don't have to sign, but you mark the date. This is the day we all agreed on this document. Life is so much better. And he reported back to me on this and his team loved it. So uh, that's pretty cool. So for planning, this is where you submit and get that charter approved. And that helps you finalize the team. You create a project plan, uh, which is a compilation of many things. There are companion documents, such as what we'll learn about, the work breakdown structure, your schedule, your risk register. A bunch of other stuff goes into the plan. When I interviewed people for project man management jobs, I would ask them, what would you put in your project plan? And people who have been trained would mention at least some of these. Uh, people who had not been trained uh, in the ways of the ninja um, would say, well, you know, what, what has to be done? How long is it going to take? And they describe a schedule. A lot of people call a schedule a plan, but it's a schedule. And it's one of the things that goes into your project plan. So that's another fun little trick <laughs> that I use. And what that would tell me is if people didn't have the right answer to that, but they were willing to get trained in... Um, in uh, project management, they didn't have to get certified. I never required certification, but they I didn't want to have to explain what a WBS is all the time or whatever, that I wanted them to be able to speak the language. Okay, any questions there? Yes. WBS again? Work, isn't that funny? Work breakdown structure. Ah. Okay. And um, and I'm being mean using that, knowing that some of you don't know what that is, but it is all the work to be done on a project. And oh, it's going to be so fun next time when we go through it. So a charter. Oh, was there more? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. So it's uh, it formally authorizes the fact that there is in fact a project. And the project manager is this person and that they have the authority to apply the resources of the organization. And depending on where you are and what you're doing, you may not have this kind of uh, process in place. But when I have gone into different situations, I would create a charter-like document. Let me write down, let me see if I've got the expectations right. And I would sit down, I would make a formal meeting, and even if it's just two of us, uh, but okay, this is what we're doing. Are we all, is this what you're looking for? Was there anything else? Am I missing anything else? Is it going to look like this? Is it, you know, try to get the people who are having you do the work. When somebody gives you something to do, create a charter-like document and reflect it back to them on paper. And there's just something about paper that makes people go, no, 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 I wanted three. You're showing me two here. I wanted three. I expected you would know that. And, um, or I don't want three suitcases. I want two suitcases and a nice little bag to go with them. Yeah, okay. You know, the, these things happen all the time and the charter can help sort that out. So call it a charter or a clarifying document. Or here's some fun little notes from the last meeting we had. Is this correct? So it is truly the initiation tool for stakeholder alignment. And that's what we call it. Um, your boss, the people on your team, we talked about um, the people who would be buying these suitcases or whatever they are and the bag. Um, they are all stakeholders. There's a lot of stakeholders, but we talk about key stakeholders really. When we're talking about it here, we're not asking everybody that ever might buy a suitcase, but the people that I work for, the people that are paying for this, people who run organizations next to me that I might be using resources that they're gonna want, um, these are stakeholders, and um, it's a precursor to 
either you're going to make a proposal to do something or you're going to create an actual plan for work. So whatever it is, you just kind of call that a plan. And first is the charter and next you get everything in place and now let's make a plan for what we're going to do. Putting a plan into place um, at businesses uh, is really hard to do if they're not familiar with this. Uh, the biggest advocate, <clears throat> excuse me, of project management in our office, Rich, uh, was first the worst. And he go, plan, 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 just do it, just do it. Even everybody's doing the check mark at Nike. Hey, just do it. And just do it gets you into trouble every time without sitting down and thinking it through. We don't uh, talk about the plan here uh, very much at all. But I just want to tell you that once you kind of are getting started, you put together a plan of who's on the team, what are we going to do? You take a piece of the charter, you put it on the top of the plan, and um, you put some details in it, the, the high deliverable dates. And, you know, not, not the schedule itself. You're going to create a schedule later on, but it has to be done by this date. And it includes these key things, these three things not included. There will not be a soft bag to go with the three suitcases. Um, people get confused about things you put in, it's not going to be this. So this is just showing us our project. Charter can be any sort of format or style. Charters um, on larger projects um, and charters for programs can be huge, <laughs> but hopefully yours isn't. So going to move on to requirements now. Taking a space. Okay. So this is so true for anything anybody's ever asking you to do something for. I didn't say that right. But I mean, even if it's what somebody wants for Christmas, sometimes I swear, getting the requirements right. What do you mean when you say this? What are the requirements? Because more times than not, um, Okay, it has to be portable. So somebody is constructing a thing that's quite portable. Um, you can make it have wheels and it can hold up to 80 pounds. Well, a requirement is that it doesn't have more than 15 pounds or something like that. But that might not come out. Somebody might think more and more and more when somebody else is thinking less, less, less. The requirement is it can't weigh more than something, or it has to be able to handle up to something. Um, so understanding them up front makes your planning a lot more effective and you waste less time. And you have to fully understand the point of the work you're doing. There could be facilities, you know, maybe something has to be built in a clean facility because there's, I don't know, electronics in it. And nobody even thought about that. We have our own factory. Oh, wait, we don't have a clean room. So where are we going to get the clean room? Oh, my gosh, we're going to go have to find one. Um, and that uh, there may be certain resources. You might have to hire a contractor with a specific skill set for an element of it. Uh, so knowing those requirements helps you plan correctly. And it's not that every single person needs to know this stuff, but as a project manager, you better ask the questions. And okay, so uh, tell me again, why are we doing this project? Why are we building three suitcases? Um, how many suitcases are on the market? Gazillions of suitcases. Well, we're going to build these because the people can ride on them. <laughs> more and more, you're seeing people driving suitcases around the airport. But there's Know the reason why you're doing it. Don't just, your job is not to just take orders. In order to fulfill orders, you need to have information. Don't be afraid to ask why. This is your charter. That um, is an example. So this is the first document. You do it in initiation. And the name, project manager, project sponsor, and uh, when did you start this? Uh, if it's a study, who, you know, blah, blah, blah. The purpose of the project and justification, or purpose of the project and the justification for the budget. 
why are we doing this? This is a big thing. You want to make sure you get this. And then what's the main deliverable? Upon completion of this project, we're going to have three suitcases, one of which is flexible and one you can drive or, or something like that. So my phone is making all kinds of... Um, noises. So anyway, you want to describe the deliverable the best you can. And you may not have all the information yet. So we start with this project. Who's on here? What are the key milestones? Start date is expected on. Did we already start? Because we're still working on the plan. So the beginning of the project hasn't happened yet. This is initiation, right? This is how we're going to start. So we want to start working on this project by what date? And what is the, and you put the big key elements, sometimes we call them milestones, um, and the dates in order here. You know, well, the first thing we're going to do is get the designs done, get those approved. Then we're going to get prototypes. Then we're going to da 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 da. Um, that's what that is about. Over here, bottom left, risks and constraints. Risks we will talk about. It's risks to the project risk to the money, to the scope, and to the timing. There's no risks to health um, or anything like that. That's compliance stuff, and that would happen elsewhere. And then constraints are, if we don't have this done by the 3rd of February next year, we have no project. We need to know that up front, right? Or another constraint um, could be we can do anything we want, but we can't go over $250,000 in development costs or we have no project, something like that. So for your purposes, you can take this and you can use this to sort of inspire your thought processes of getting a more holistic view um, of what you're going to do. Risks, for example, and we will talk about those later, but later, but Right at this point is you're creating your own document starter thing. You, if you sat down and said, all right, as I know right now, everything I know about my little project right now, what could go wrong? And if you spent a minute just listing as many things as you can of what could go wrong, it takes no time at all. You can think of a lot. And giving some thought to that is great. And then being able to recognize your constraints is great. And then at the bottom here, you can see that this is page two in your handout. Um, did we, um, Shannon, did we get the handout set? Okay, yes, so it's in the chat. Oh, okay, that's right. As you told me it would be. <laughs> okay, so I, I think this is what I have for today. Oh, you'll get tired of seeing this. Oh, yeah, it's a little bit busy, um, but I'm bragging on this is my uh, most recent book. It's a kid's book. And I got bestseller um, in two places and Mom's Choice Award. So that just came in last week. And um, that's very fun. So I'm going to get rid of this. And I guess I'll just stop sharing. And I would really hope you guys have some questions. Is there anything you'd like to discuss or... I finished a little early. No, good information. It's good to to go through it step by step because, yeah, like the charter was a little bit fuzzy. I've never had to like create a charter. Um, I've worked on projects where someone else created it, but it was still like kind of gray. Yeah. <laughs> or, or you unclear. know, one of the one of the things when I was first having to do that, what is the question we're trying to answer? Okay. Here's mine. What are you asking me? <laughs> you know, I don't know what to put there. And so we arranged to have that go away. And what is the purpose of this project? You know, so you create it in your own language. If they don't have one for you to create one, you just create it in your own language. And it's all about what are we doing and leave a space for it. And what aren't we doing? We had a... Um, in one of the templates I had, we entered in, in scope, out of scope. We had a high-level manager in manufacturing desperately wanting us to put, um, to create a product for Mexico. And um, we were creating products for 
three or four different countries, and Mexico wasn't one of them, but she really wanted one for Mexico. So she kept putting that in, and she was a higher level. You get this thing with levels, and she's a high level on the team, and she's talking to the engineers saying, we got to add, we got to add Mexico. Well, you know, I don't know. Everybody's kind of... So when I came in on the project, it was a train wreck, and um, I got this information, and I showed them the new plan, and it had in scope, out of scope, and Mexico was out of scope. She goes, what? And I go, hey, take it up with the supreme beings here, because the, these are our marching orders. So it was a great clarification, and we needed to have something like that. We didn't have that before, but now I always mention what's in scope and out of scope. Have a little section just in case. So out of scope would be any any of those extras that last minute, they're like, oh, can you do this? Can you add this piece to it? Okay. Yeah, and um, we don't really go into depth here, but since we have a couple more minutes, I think. Um, PMs learn to say no, make no your first answer and see what happens. Now, culture of the organization is critical here. But when you, if you are forced into a yes, say, okay, yes, well, I have a few questions for you. And in that handout, there's a um, a tool for changes to the project. Let me see what it's going to, you know, okay, if you really think we need to do this, I got to run it by a few people. So can you fill out this form, put your name right here and the change you want and why you want it. And then I will go back with the team. We'll assess to see if it has an effect on any of the, um, the triple constraints on time budget or scope um, so that we could still meet because management is crazy with this. When are you going to have it? And you give them a day and then they start adding things and say, okay, let me just work with the team real quick and we'll show you what the, if it's going to, if it's going to make a difference, they think it won't, you will have to look at the workload and this work breakdown structure. This is the tool of the universe to deal with that. And this workload is not in here. So you insert a whole bunch of tasks and then there goes the, uh, the, the launch date. And you can show why. I like that. Thank you. That was very useful. Oh, I good. just have another question. Can you cal uh, elaborate a little bit more about the WBS? Yes. Yeah, because it's a little bit vague. Yeah. And I'm doing that to you on purpose because I'm oh. me. Um, so I love that you're curious. So the work breakdown structure, um, when we talked about, okay, we're going to have to get the design for, the first thing we're going to do on our suitcase project is get a design for the three pieces. And that would be, when that's all done, that's like a deliverable. And we've done some amount of work. So I would put... I'm, I work on a wall, I use sticky notes, and it's the design. Now, in order to get the design, what do we have to do? We have to figure out, well, where are the designer? Who, who are the designers? And maybe we're going to have to go out and find them. So we'll have to create contracts. Each one of these things is now an activity, an action. Some work must be done. Find the designers, create the contracts. Give them our requirements definition, not more than this, not less than that. And by the way, where do we get that requirements definition from? That's from the engineering group. So they're going to have some work to do before I can finish my work with the designer. That's going to be a link in a schedule as we go further down. But right now, we're just saying, what are the to-dos that we need for the design? And then the engineers are going to have uh, to-do list for things, and you get everybody's to-do list, then you knit them together into a schedule. Does that help? So is it basically it's the work done by the PM, the product man, uh, the project manager. No, the pro the project manager makes it happen. Project manager doesn't know what the designers need or what the engineers need. The 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 people on your team know what's needed. So a lot of people think the project manager's job is to go into their cube or their home, which wherever they're working from, and create the schedule and put list out all the things that need to be done. But they don't know that. And if they do know that, we don't need half the people, right? So um, uh, I have a, uh, we'll see a, a real life example of a remodel uh, work breakdown structure. 
And uh, so let's see, I'm going to gut the place. So there's like this demolition piece that has to happen. And then we need the cabinets, but I need new, I need a new floor and we're going to paint. And oh my God, what are we doing first? What are we doing last? And what all has to be done? And I had a little nervous breakdown and I thought, oh, we're breakdown structure. That's what I need. And so we'll have some examples of it. The people who are doing the work should be part of building it. In project management, the project manager is a very great facilitator in meetings where you pull the team members in and they tell you what they have to do and how long it will take. If you are assigning their time and you are telling them what they have to do, they're just sitting there, okay, yeah, whatever. They have no skin in the game. You need to be able to go, wait a minute. Now we met on this and you gave me these time frames. What changed? What, you know, okay, we have to change, but what changed? Holding people accountable to what they provided you. So can I rephrase it like that? So the project manager probably don't know, or probably they won't know anything. <laughs> they won't know everything, but they are the one who pulls the expertise together to build that WBS. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And, I, and I promise this will be um, clear, but uh, this, what you had just said is something that is said a lot. The project manager isn't going to know anything. Yeah. Um, they aren't going to do anything. Can you imagine what the project manager might know? Yeah, that's that's the that's my question because I used to think like the project manager know everything, but then he's just not the one who do the thing. <laughs> but he should right. know. He's the boss. No. Yeah, 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 something like that. So that's my understanding. But what what your introduction today feels like is probably not. <laughs> and remember, I said that um, Pembot six weighs about two pounds. Um, I haven't weighed uh, kind of about seven yet, but we're probably at three or more pounds of materials of things that project managers need to understand and do. And they would, they have, what they do is what this presentation is all about. Okay. So what, my colleague, we teach at University of Chicago, and I've caught him twice now saying, well, project manager really doesn't do anything. And I said, you have got to stop saying it because you have to manage a lot. There's a lot that the project manager does that no one else does. Okay. So nobody's going to go over and tell the marketing person that they are interrupting, blah, 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 or they can't have their samples. Then it's going to have to be here. The, you know, the engineer doesn't want to do that. You send the project manager. So the project manager does manage that project and they make sure that the um, that the team has everything they know to do their very best work. If in fact, you know everything that has to be done, you probably don't have a big project, you have a small project. You know, if you're gonna do spring cleaning in your home, you don't need a team, right? Well, which I did, just call them in and tell them to do it. But yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, so it, when you, if you do know all the steps that have to be done and all that sort of thing, then that's a different situation. Um, it's still a project, but it's a small project. And um, it could be a great big one in a very narrow field where you don't need a lot of other input, but most likely you're gonna be working with, um, you know, somebody's gonna come and pour concrete if you're building a garage. And um, how are you gonna do that? I gotta find a contractor. and. And I don't know how long it takes for it to cure. When can I do the next step? So, um, but today, right now, I have a friend who's consulting um, at a very big company and they're still doing that. that. I mean, and when that happens, that's an organization that misses their deadlines a lot. The It's not only getting correct information, but it is getting team members to have um accountability to have skin in the game is the only way I know how to say it, that they have put, they have made a promise to me. This is how long it's going to take me. And this is how I'm going to do it. And these are the resources that I need so that I can make sure he or she gets. It. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. As my husband says, yeah, project managers, 90% of the time they're talking. <laughs> Easier said than done because there are a lot of um, management skills, I assume. 
from what I heard from yeah. you. Yeah. So, because what I work is more like a specialist field. So I think I'm part of the program. <laughs> but management, it seems like it's a whole bigger picture to manage the people and pieces. Yeah, right? well, to lead people and manage stuff. And there are managers. There's a manager in charge of all design work. And he's got designers and he manages the annual reviews and salaries and vacation and requirements. And they, he sends them out to projects. Um, that's a different role. That is not a project manager. Thank you. <laughs> sure. So we're just under an hour. Do you I feel longer. <laughs> this is amazing. Um, would you please send me the slides because I will send those out with the recording to everybody here, plus those who registered and didn't get to make it. Um, and then, um, so are we the next three weeks? Because I, I next two weeks after this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Same time, same station. Okay, so I will make sure that you guys get the link to the. Uh, sign ups for those and uh, and I have corrected the event right right now to make sure that it has the correct link and telling people just grab the link from the actual um, notification itself because or the the uh, the sign up itself because I don't know what happened and uh, I'm going to find out from event bright as soon as I can. <laughs> Hopefully there's a number of you out there seeing this video. And you'll be well prepared for our next one. Yes, yes. And I will send the workbook to those who weren't able to get it today. Um, if you did not grab it from the chat, I suggest doing so before you leave um, and downloading it. Uh, if not, I will. I can include it in the, the things that I'm sending out. Thank you. Yeah, no, wonderful. I, I appreciate Dee for doing this. She doesn't have fun. to. And, uh, and uh, we had a, seems like we had a good group here, the ones that got to show up, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to join us next week. I will make sure that everybody is aware of the next two weeks if you want to get the whole, the full on project management experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I just saw there's a question here about AI and project management. I'll talk to that next time. I'll, I'll just mention that I'm not real experienced with it yet, but I imagine there'll be, there's all kinds of stuff. There's all kinds of stuff talking about this. So I'll try to um, get some information on that as well. And thank you, everyone. It's thank just going to affect everything in our lives. Thank you, ladies. You have a wonderful rest of the day. And we will see you next week, Dee. Thank you. Bye, Bye. Bye everyone. <laughs>